Thank you very much. So tonight we are rethinking the nation here in the north and we're going to begin by watching some video clips um, or from local people uh, and that's going to we hope spur some discussion. So if we could have the first set of clips. Just have to be a little patient. So these have all been filmed on streets in Kirklees. I know there are some from Leeds, I think there's some from Manchester, uh, and some from the Kirklees Huddersfield area. Um, and you'll see, I don't know if you'll see anybody you recognise, who knows, um, but a range of people really reflecting various aspects of, um, of local life. White British people often have said to me, oh, uh, you're born here, but you dress the way you dress. That's a barrier for, for some time. That, don't you think that's a barrier? And I've said, no, it's a barrier for you, not me. I accept you the way you dress. Why can't you accept me? That sense of belonging is hard as well when you go back to the Caribbean islands because, in essence, you actually fit nowhere. So you have to go past the Caribbean islands and actually go back to the African continent to get a sense of belonging in who you are. Even David Cameron, when he says uh, British Muslims need to integrate in the society, well, we are integrated. I mean, they say they isolate themselves. We don't isolate ourselves. Foreign student from Bosnia. I'm studying here in the University of Manchester. I haven't expected Britain to be this, this uh, welcoming to me. Uh, so far, I've had great experiences. But one thing that, that caught my eye was uh, the fact that British people uh, are are a bit a bit racist. Excellent. So our first set set of uh, clips then about about barriers, about belonging, the extent to which those barriers might be a stumbling block and the extent to which they might be overcome. So, who would like to be begin? May I start with you, Joanne? Yes, if you like. Um, what, what question am I addressing particularly here? There were several. Well, to take your pick. Well, I think that given that my mother is French and she came over to, to Yorkshire not speaking any English in the 60s, and this was Barnsley, not a particularly <laughs> cosmopolitan place at the time. I think we, we saw a certain amount of, at the same time, incredible friendliness and also some hostility. My mother remembers uh, taking me to nursery school and me speaking French and the other mothers drawing away as if somehow being foreign could be catching. And so I think there is a certain kind of reserve in some people, and I think there is, particularly perhaps in the North, a tendency to, to feel that other cultures are strange and a bit worrying. And I, I think that, you know, I've seen this in Huddersfield where I live too. I, I've seen a certain amount of, of withdrawing from other cultures. Admittedly, sometimes it's not always easy. So, uh, are we more reserved in the North? Other aspects of belonging and the barriers to belonging that, that you'd like to address? No, I, don't, I don't think we're more reserved in the north particularly. Um, I think, what do I think about that? I think that um, there is a little bit of a, uh, I guess there's a little bit of a tendency to, for people to do their own thing in the North, that people are quite clear about the things that interest them and that they want to do, particularly culturally. There's not a great deal of porosity, I think, mm. in the cultural sphere. I think you have a lot of people, I mean, there's fantastic work that you're doing with the, your literature festival, for you know, which is, which is brilliant. But I, I do think that there's a kind of, there, there is the community that like to go to the opera, mm. say, and mm. there is the community that like to go to um, a, a literature festival. And there's not an awful lot of uh, migration between those kind of cultural activities that people do. And I think that that can, um, 
stifle uh, a feeling of sharing. You know, I've been thinking a lot recently about the um, about the Paris attacks and the fact that the uh, places, the main places attacked, are places where people congregate and share and come together. So a theatre, a football stadium, a restaurant, and how important it is that we have places where we do have. Um, people coming together from different places in order to be collectively in one place. So I think that doesn't answer your question at all, but that's what I'm thinking about at the moment. But it's, uh, I think it's interesting to pose the question about whether culture can be the, the, the thing that breaks, breaks down boundaries. Um, so I think that's one issue you might like to address. But the other thing that's come up really is the question of whether it's possible to be both racist and welcoming at the same time, which is, I think, quite an interesting question to pose in the North. Would you like to pick up one of those or something else, Simon? <laughs> I'll pick up both of those. Um, I think um, in terms of culture, I think culture can be used um, to break down barriers. One of the things that we talk about with our festival is it's, we talk about cultural literacy um, and how actually in order to really understand another culture, you have to experience that culture in the way that that culture experiences itself. Um, so I know, for example, uh, because as, as a child, I had a few years um, in Pakistan. My, my parents were first generation and were that, had that typical myth of we're going to go home. So we went home quite a few times and equally came back quite quickly. <laughs> but um, I know that having lived in Pakistan, there are cultural nuances that I understand that my daughter just does not and probably never will because she's, she doesn't live there. Um, so within the festival we talk about that and we try to let people experience other cultures in the way that those cultures would experience themselves. So that it's, it's about that thing about that every culture is equally valid, which I think is some, something that we sometimes lose. Um, I think in any country where you have one dominant culture, it is that culture can, that, that can be seen to be more valid than the other cultures that are minority cultures and have come into that country. Um, I think the point you were making about, about North and South and I think when I lived in London I found, um, I think because there is so much um, diversity if, if, if we call it that, um, there are people from so many different backgrounds, people probably don't um, look at you in the same way as they may in, in the North but I think the North is actually far friendlier but I think the, uh, the best example I have of that racism coupled with uh, the friendliness uh, is when I moved into my new house my next door neighbour was very welcoming and I remember having this conversation over the garden fence where he said well you know you guys are great um, you know you're English better than mine but you know it's, it's the rest of them I'm moving to Australia because you know this country is going to be a Muslim country in 20 years he has now moved to Australia <laughs> But it was, you know, it's, it's those kinds of things where you kind of think, um, yes, but I am one of them, you know, no matter how you might actually say to me, well, your English is like this or you dress like this. Um, and to actually pick up the point that was made on the video by the lady who was saying, I dress in a particular way, so, you know, and why can't people accept me for that? I mean, I find that quite interesting. I dress, um, I dress in a number of different ways, so, you know, I can, I can dress the way I'm dressed and... Um, people I know will be viewing me in, in one particular way. And I, I certainly, when I used to sort of work in the, the corporate world, um, I used to find, I, I used to, it was kind of like the petrol pump, um, petrol station uh, kind of test, where if you, if I drew up in my car, in my business suit, I would get spoken to in one way. If I drew up in a shawar kameez, I would get spoken to in a different way. And if I was going to be going to the mosque, and I drew up to fill up in, wearing a hijab and an abaya, I would definitely get spoken to in a different way. And I think it is that thing of, um, to me, I'm still the same person. Mm. Um, but I can see that th the other person is perceiving me differently. And I think mm. the most interesting, I'll, I'll, I'll finish up, the most interesting mm -hmm. test I had of that was, I've, I've just been in Japan recently, uh, both myself and my colleague, we're both South Asian. And it was quite funny because you'd, you'd walk out onto a, a platform you know, in a train station or something, and you would see European people there, and you'd get this feeling of, ah, oh, they're from where we're from. <laughs> and of course you knew that they had no, they were not thinking the same thing when they were looking at you. <laughs> and that was actually really interesting for us. 
Uh, any responses? I mean, you work with um, refugees and uh, migrants and with organisations that work with them, and those are people who, on a, on a regular basis, are experiencing those boundaries and, and maybe on a day-to-day -day basis issues about belonging. Mm -hmm. um, so anything you'd like to um, add? Yeah, I mean, partly I think we need to always be mindful of the language that we're using. I was noticing in the clip the woman was saying about being asked to integrate into society rather than you know integration being something that happens as people move around the world and settle in one area, get to know each other. It's a, it's a two-way process. But it seems more and more people are being asked, you must integrate into our society, which then, or our culture, which then makes you think, well, which culture? Is it, you know, some sort of British culture? Whose idea of British culture are we talking about? And there are barriers to being part of that culture. Like, I don't feel any um, sort of affinity to the culture of, you know, David Cameron, who's asking that woman to integrate into her culture. He comes from a completely different culture than I do, not just because I come from Glasgow, but because of the so there's a big class difference here as well. Um, there are, yeah, so there's lots of barriers, there's lots of language barriers, the language that we use and the language that we ask people to use. And the refugees, asylum seekers and other migrants that we work with day to day, they're seeing increasing barriers to just taking part, being part of society at all. They've been excluded deliberately by legislation, by procedures, and by policies which don't allow people to have the same sort of interact, social interaction at all. And a lot of these laws that have been brought in now to stop immigration, to target undocumented migrants, so the government would call illegal migrants, people that don't have papers to stay here yet, are not just impacting on undocumented migrants. They're impacting on anyone who is perceived to be possibly a migrant. So for example, you've got, uh, you're going to apply for a house now uh, from a private landlord. The private landlord is going to be under a legal obligation to check whether you're entitled to it, whether you have the documents. So who are they going to look at? You know, if I go up and ask, I'm all right, I've got the right accent, the right skin color, but anyone else is going to be uh, going basically through an immigration control system that's been outsourced to a private landlord who's going to be checking the skin color and the passports of people that they think and maybe. So you can't even, you know, it's going to be impacting on people that, that uh, do have permission to stay. There are lots of barriers that are coming in that it seems to be increasing now than, uh, than it has been in the past. Okay, well, thank you very much. So hold those thoughts on barriers and belonging because I think those issues will come up again and particularly the one about uh, whether it's possible to be racist and welcoming, which I think is a really interesting idea to carry with us and to think mm -hmm. through in relation to some of our other themes. If we could take a look at maybe here, the other... We are, we're going to do something slightly different, I'm afraid. I'm okay. going to voice a couple of the questions that we have on our box cards. Okay. We won't be able to see them, unfortunately, but we were hoping then that we could draw on our audience for some questions to our okay. panel as well about We Think in the Nation. Um, I'll just give everybody a moment to think about it because one which we haven't been able to hear from was a, a young black male saying that I was born in England, raised in England, but I'm British. How come? So that slippage between Englishness and Britishness. Mm. Do you want us to address that or do we want to take anything else? Just, just to give people some thinking time. Okay. So, uh, born, um, born and brought up in, in England, but I'm British. So it's this issue about Englishness and Britishness and the slippage between them. Anybody want to, anybody got a thought on that? that they would like to throw in. It's not a problem that I deal with very often. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but you might deal with another, well, maybe, yeah, it depends how, what your feelings were, but you might dish, uh, have then to face the one about Scottish and, yeah. and British. Yeah, we, well, we've had to face that uh, quite a lot recently in the movement mm -hmm. for uh, Scottish independence and the referendum that was had on that, and that brought a lot of these issues to the surface about where people want to identify who, who, um, who are living in Scotland. So remember, it wasn't a referendum just for Scottish people, but for people who live in Scotland and whether they thought they wanted Scotland to remain part of the country known as the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which is you know, quite a long title I always find for our country. Uh, and it did bring a lot of the, these issues up. But and, uh, I find living in England as I do now, speaking to people 
I thought coming down here and I was going, oh, you see, you support the English football team, that's great, you know, I'll, I'll try and cheer them on when they're playing because <laughs> the Scottish football team doesn't play that well. Uh, so you identify with being English and most of my friends that are maybe a bit sort of liberal or lefty or whatever are saying, oh, no, we can't say we're English because, you know, that seems to be taken over into some sort of racist overtones in now, so we'd rather be British. But myself, growing up in a certain part of Glasgow, we never identified as being British. I'm of Irish heritage, Irish Catholic heritage, and we would have been the other side of this sort of divide. Mm. And say, oh no, you know, we've got lots of English friends, we don't mind that, but this British thing, that's a bit, a bit weird. Yeah, it's interesting, it isn't it? It was different. My English friends found, you know, a different mm. uh, identity. Let's see what um, the audience thinks about that, or just by a show of hands now, who prefers to say they're British, given the choice? And what about English? I don't, of course, not, some of you won't be English. Some of you really want to identify with it, or feel very comfortable, perhaps, identifying with the concept of English. What about Yorkshire? Um, uh, <laughs> how many of you want to identify with Yorkshire? Uh, as uh, having many as the English. <laughs> More than me. Yeah, yeah, wrong side of the Pennines. Personally, I've, I've recently moved to Lancashire, and I've come in for a lot of stick in making that move from mm. Yorkshire to Lancashire. But I mean, I certainly was, I was born in England to English parents. It, it would seem, it's, it's difficult. For, I'm not saying I'm not British, but it would be hard for me to deny a connection with England. I've always lived here. Are there other people in that situation? Are you in that but situation? I'm not in that situation. I'm, I'm Welsh. Um, <laughs> So, so I don't have the problem, but uh, or the, the so, oh, I do have the problem, but I don't have the same problem. But I would certainly rather be Welsh or British. I, I, I slightly would feel slightly uncomfortable about identifying with English for for all kinds of reasons. But I was just thinking while you were asking the question that one of the one of the things that's happening in this country now in the in the Great Britain and Northern Ireland country is is the whoa, is the devolution movement and you know Scotland has you know one of the interesting things when the when the referendum was happening was the number of people number of English people who were saying how can I join the SNP mm -hmm. where do I where do I sign up I, I, I identify more with that politics and that culture and that communitarianism than I do with the English that supposedly represent me at, at Whitehall so I think I think it's a really fraught question um, at the moment and yeah. you know it surprised me reading that quotation from the guy saying he, he wanted to be he wanted to identify as English rather than British because I I don't know I would have thought it would be great to identify with being British why why confine yourself to one part of it anybody uh, either of our other panelists want to comment on that well I'm very interested about this this business of having to identify as one particular thing I have never identified as one particular thing, and, and when I was a kid, I was often asked, you know, are you French, are you English? And I wasn't able to answer because, of course, I was both in equal parts, and, and there was no dividing those things. So I don't see why you can't identify as being several things at once. These things are intersectional. It's not just one thing. You're not just English or Yorkshire or, or whatever. We are all... Yeah several and, things and, 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 and they're little yeah, yeah. Russian dolls containing yeah. themselves and of course we're all broadly speaking Europeans yeah. as well. Yeah. For a while. <laughs> For a while. <laughs> I, think, um, I think maybe what, the, what, uh, what was actually being said, maybe that's a reaction as well. Because yeah. I think if you are actually coming from a community where you are being continuously told that you are either not British or not English because of the way that you look, then maybe it becomes... Um, Yes. It's a sense of belonging to be able to say that you are English because it identifies you with that place that you are living in. Mm. And I think, I think it's one of those things, isn't it? When you are actually in a country um, and there is no barrier to you being able to identify mm. with that country, then, then it's not actually an that, issue. Of course, of course. Yeah. But yeah. it is an issue if yeah. you can't do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I have never thought... I, I don't, you see, I, I wouldn't think of, my, I think of myself as British. I mean, I, I was born in England to Pakistani parents. I, I, I've never really thought of myself as English, but I don't think I, anybody has ever, I think part of that is nobody has ever perceived me as English. Nobody would actually describe me as English. So maybe that's part of the reason why it never occurred to me to describe mm. myself as English. Mm -hmm. I would always say British. Mm. Do you have another question for us, Jodie, or shall we? I think 
Mr. Enoch Powell defined what an English person is. <laughs> Your parents have to be English in terms of law, right of usually. My Latin is not good. Right to the soil. I'm proud father of three Englishmen, according to the law. <laughs> I was in terms of multiplicity of identities, which we all carry. I was born in 45 as a, as a colonial subject of the king. I had right of free entry under British Nationality Act 1948, and it was the conservatives which wanted to give that right to all king's subjects to come here and live and enjoy all. But of course, only the Nawabs and Maharajas could come here and learn at Oxford and Cambridge <laughs> how to rule India. As Mikauli said, the color of the civil servant would be different. Now, I think, I think the idea of race is explained well by Professor Michael Benton and John Harwood when he said, when an astronaut looks down, doesn't see any political uh, divisions. I think the debate between Professor John Rex and Professor Michael Benton, one said Powell was a racist, which was John Rex, South African, yeah, Marxist, and the other one was an English gentleman, historian from University of Bristol. He said, he said the Powell was ethnocentric. So I'm not going to give a free lecture. I'm former vice <laughs> chair of National Association of Racial Equality Councils and a member of CRE Planning Forum. I don't drink girders, but I did work at Green Mountain. I have a lot of relatives <laughs> in Scotland. Some of them now have been elected MPs. Thank you very much. Very Thank good. you very much for your contribution. Um, I think we touched, we touched on ethnicity there. I think we may be able to watch some of our videos on so we'll give those a go. We'll give it one big try. Migrants and refugees. Why refugees are allowed, uh, are accepted yet in Britain, whereas they are in a lot of different countries. Germany is accepting them, Greece is accepting them. So. Oh. Other people are going to turn round and go because my name's Amor, there's no way I can be British. That's their problem, it's not mine. Okay, that is their problem. Well, actually, it is my problem because it's what, 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 what people like myself, who, who are deemed the other, have to experience every single day. But for other people, the colour of my skin, my religion, my, my ethnic background means something to them which, which excludes me from certain definitions of Britishness or which makes them say that I've got to do, I've got to prove my Britishness. Why, why should I prove my Britishness? Living in Britain right now, for somebody like me, is a constant source of navigating your identity, navigating, looking for solutions all the time and having to, and, and, and it's sad, but having to justify your existence you know, and, and it actually upsets me, you know what I mean? That you have to justify your existence, right? You know, it's almost like you have to prove that you have a right to be a human, prove that you have a right to be here. Sometimes I think you can feel black and British. Majority of the time, I don't think it's there. I think they're taking the English, British Empire, they're trying to bring that identity back into Britain the British Empire, where we rule predominantly white British. So um, as a <clears throat> black British in that environment, you don't feel part of it. Even though I was born here, I don't feel particularly British because people will view me by my skin colour. When I walk into a room, be it a conference, a seminar or just a meeting, people see a black woman. And no matter how long I've been here, as in being born here, they still say, where do you come from? Yeah? So, you know, if I say Lee, they go, no, 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 no. Where do you come from? And they mean my ethnicity. So that's why I relate to that, because that's what I'm representing. I'm dealing with racism 
I'm dealing with with not the fact that I'm I'm not considered English. I'm not considered British either. I'm it's it's a it's 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 really a struggle because I I always believe that uh, um, especially in my adulthood, especially now, I'm in a struggle. I'm in a I'm in a struggle with the uh, the mainstream society to to give me acceptance. Black, British. That's we're still working that through. You can be okay. So quite a lot of um, issues raised there. I mean, obviously, principally this one, um, principally this one about uh, the relationship between race and uh, British identity. But you've, we've also heard there about the struggle involved, about the issue of negotiation, people trying to negotiate their identities, but also the idea that it might be becoming more difficult. Um, I mean, I have to confess that I, in my, it's quite a long time ago now, but I did ask somebody where they were from, just as that, that woman says. People ask me where I was from, and I say Leeds. And so often, I think we've all probably made that mistake, and you, it's possible to make that mistake, mistake irrespective of people's skin colour. Um, but it is a common mistake that people make. But is it getting, is it becoming more of a problem? Are things changing? Is it, are we becoming a less accepting society? Does anybody want to wish, uh, um, take on the issue about change or any of the other things that were um, raised in the film? Who wants to start? Simon? Yeah, um, I think the, I, mean, I, I get asked that question frequently. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's slap that and I'm from Bradford. But are you from Bradford? <laughs> But the thing is, actually, I don't, I don't think actually it's a problem. I have no uh, issue saying, oh, well, you know, my parents are from Pakistan and Pakistan inherited. I think the problem is the question is becoming more and more loaded. And now it's, um, and I think the reason why probably that lady has an issue with it is it is, again, that thing of, well, you don't really belong. Well, you can't really be from me. And, it's, and I think the, the issue is, so I think maybe for my parents' generation, it probably wasn't an issue because they hadn't, you know, been grown up in the country or they that sense of belonging. I think when you've grown up in a place, that's where you feel you belong. So when you are continuously asked, yes, well, where are you really from? And you think, well, I'm not really from anywhere other than mm. here because this is where I, you know, this is what I identify with. I think it's sad. And I think um, in terms of what you were saying, I think given current, um, the current world events, given what we've just had in Paris, given what has been going on over the last, well, since, um, since the, you know, since 9 11 since the war on terror, yes, these questions are becoming more and more loaded. There are people who are starting to feel more and more um, as though they don't belong. I think the, the gentleman that goes on saying that constant thing of having mm. to prove yourself. And it, and it is, I mean, I think, and I can say as for sure, every time, every time a bomb goes off, you think, oh, God, not again. Because there is that thing of, you, you are asked as though, you hold the answers, and, and I think the in terms of the, the political rhetoric that there is now about the Muslim community having to do more. There's something, and I just sometimes think I have no idea what my neighbours are doing. No idea. I, I hope most of the time but I know what my daughter's doing. Um, but there is, you know, we're all human at the end of the day, and it's these things are becoming more and more difficult. The onus that there is now in communities to step up to the mark, mm. um, it's difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I could hear you. Nodding well, in I was, my uh, ear. Well, no, I was agreeing. I mean, I, I've, uh, the, oh, are we doing this now? I, think so. I was, I was thinking about. I mean, it's not um, addressing the question of whether it's getting worse. I suspect it is, and I, I, yeah, I think what you were just describing is is palpable, really. And I was thinking about the what the role is of, of the arts and culture in not necessarily countering. Well, yes, countering that. What 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 is the role that we need to play and that we need to be resourced to play? in that debate and I think that there are two things that come to mind for me and they're part of the same thing really but on the one hand we need to obviously we need to create cultural a cultural life that uh, counters that and that and that argues against it and um, challenges those perceptions 
But at the same time, I think we also need, because it's so prevalent, we also need to provide, um, we also need to provide uh, the site or sites in which those feelings are validated, actually, yes. and are recognised and acknowledged that they're real, rather than it being a, 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 an argument. I feel this way, well, you shouldn't. You know, which is crazy, and uh, you know, and, and the other. Sorry, just uh, uh, the final thing I was going to say about culture is that you know, if you look at any any body of work in 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 the arts and culture, whether it's whether you're interested in novels or opera or cinema or theatre or whatever, these things are full of people who are feeling out, that they are the outsiders, that they're estranged. You know, whether it's Hamlet or. Madame Butterfly or, or, or Luke Skywalker, it does, you know, these people who feel that they are not part of the mainstream and they need to. So we need to, uh, we need to kind of um, deploy the resource of culture to give people patterns to recognise their own narratives within and not, not say, you know, culture. It, I think that, you know, one of the things that's happened to culture over the last 20, 25 years, particularly, well, no, it has happened to culture generally. Uh, is that it's become utterly synonymous with entertainment, with the entertainment industry, rather than uh, vehicles through which to make change happen. And you know, it's a, you go a long way back to Bertolt Brecht saying that um, saying that art isn't, uh, um, theatre isn't a, a mirror, isn't holding up a mirror to society. It's a hammer with which to shape society. And I think we've kind of lost that passion about, uh, and we need to get it back. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, I know uh, Simon wanted to come back. No, sorry, I was just going to say, um, I completely agree with you. I think culture has a big part to play, and I think part of that is actually creating those spaces where you can have those, you know, those difficult discussions. We are increasingly um, losing the language with which to um, address issues without being lab labelled in some kind of way, or either racist or very Islamophobic or anti-Semitic, but we, we are something. But actually, there's a very big elephant in the room most of the time, and it has to be talked about, otherwise, it is an issue. Thank you. Did, did you want to add to that, Joanne? Yeah, um, which, which one are we using? Um, it, it seems to me that I, I think perhaps this is a particularly British thing, but I think it's also a human thing, that we tend to devolve into smaller and smaller groups and tribes. And it seems to me that over the last 20 years or so, we have been factionalising to such an extent that we're now tribes of one or two or three people at the most. Uh, we're not looking anymore at the things we have in common. We're constantly looking at the things that are different. And so we can be in a group of, let's say, feminists, but, oh, hang on, you're a bit radical, so you're not one of us. Or you think trans people can be, can, can be a different gender, so you're not one of us either. And, and all of a sudden you're in, you're, you've got these little splinter groups arriving, or you can be a gamer, but you know, it's not enough just to be a gamer. You have to be a gamer who believes in ethics and games journalism or not. <laughs> and, and there you have to create another faction. You have to be enemies with somebody. It, it seems to me that one of our solutions, if there is a, an easy solution, and I suspect there isn't, is to try to understand the things that we have in common as opposed to constantly isolating the things that set us apart from mm -hmm. each other because however different we are racially or culturally or whatever we still have a great deal more in common than anything else and I think that culture and the arts is one of these ways in which we can help to to build empathy and build bridges and rather than wall off cultures and different faiths and different attitudes to try to embrace them and understand their narratives and to try and bring them into our world. That doesn't mean that whatever culture we particularly identify with is going to be lost. Quite the contrary. It is going to be enriched because that's what empathy and communication and contact with other human beings does. And this, I think, is one of the essential roles of the arts, whether <coughs> whether it is about entertainment or not. I'm not entirely um, with you on, on Brecht, because I think there are some people who will like Brecht and some people who will like Star Wars, and that too is, is fine. But I think that really is the bringing of people together and the sharing of people's narratives is the important thing in the arts that we should be looking at. Um, so, yeah, that's a thought. Thank you very much. How many secret uh, Luke Skywalkers have we got in the audience? 
people who want to follow in the path of Luke Skywalker. It's a great, a great, great role model. Um, now, right at the beginning of that clip, there was um, a young woman, and she was asking questions about, um, about migrants and refugees. She was asking about the current refugee crisis, and she was really asking the question, have we become a society that is less accepting of migrants and refugees? And I'd, I'd like to go back to that question, if I may, partly because I've got somebody who works very directly in, in that field to my left. But, yeah, are we becoming a, a less accepting society in that sense, do you think? Let me hand you the microphone. <laughs> as a society, yeah. Uh, as a different communities within British society, then maybe not, because there are differences. Uh, a few years ago, um, oh gosh, 10 years ago now, I was working for uh, lots of Scottish local authorities who were basically trying to pay me to make sure that they got more migrants coming to them than the next door local authority. That's what they wanted to attract, as many migrants as possible. Although it has to be said, they were mainly looking to attract European migrants at the time. When we think of how things have changed in migration patterns over the years, uh, 10 years ago we had twice as many asylum seekers getting to the UK to claim a refugee state, to ask for refugee status than we've got now. But I think the public perception is that we've got loads more now when actually we've got far fewer because people can't get here because generally they die on the way at the borders of Fortress Europe. People aren't able to get here. But when they do get here, okay, the narrative that comes from the government quite often is to say that this is a threat to our society. And again, you have to keep thinking, well, who is saying what is the society that, that, that is going to benefit? Because the government wants to control migration, as they say, for the benefit of Britain, for the benefit of British society. But the actions they take to do this don't actually make sense in that way. If you look at, for example, the rules on uh, migration to bring spouses to the UK, so they've changed the rules so that you now have to be earning uh, £18,600 before you can... Uh, have a visa for your, your husband or wife to live with you in the UK. That excludes half the people in the country. They're not allowed to fall in love with someone that's not British born uh, from outside uh, Europe to come and live with them in this country. It's been estimated that that by uh, one of the universities, I can't remember which one, that, that over the last couple of years since they brought that in has cost the UK economy perhaps £250 million pounds of uh, earnings and taxation that would have been brought. So even if you look at it from the point of view of the, 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 the party of business um, that's in control at the moment, it doesn't make any sense in that way. It's done for different reasons. They set targets. It's part of a change, I think, in a society which has become more polarized. And we talk about society, I'm, I'm 46 years old. It was, I was 10 years old when somebody said there's no such thing as society. And that was, you know, uh, a government at that time, which actually, looking back, is, uh, was probably quite progressive compared to the one that we've got now when it comes to migration and uh, offering sanctuary to people who are um, uh, seeking refugee status under the, the Refugee Convention. So, yeah, I think a lot of things have got a lot worse in this way, but there are... It depends on when you look at who, who's, who's uh, making these decisions. When I speak to refugees and asylum seekers who are living in Britain, the two places they really want to live, when I've met them, they get forced to live wherever they, they're, they're um, told to by the government. Generally, they'll say Scotland or Yorkshire, right? <laughs> and that's the places where they've had the most welcome. I'm not saying, like, a lot of people in Scotland say, oh, there's no such thing as racism in Scotland. That's all them English. They're the racist ones. <laughs> Nonsense, of course. <laughs> but there is something that's happened, mm. uh, and it wasn't just by accident, when asylum seekers first started to come to uh, Glasgow in 1999, there was community groups got set up and to help people to arrive. The first reaction was actually, oh, these asylum seekers coming here and taking our houses, getting all this money. When a lot of people in Glasgow realized that they'd been lied to about that by the press, they weren't very pleased that they'd been fed these lies and started just local community groups, uh, working class people in housing estates started setting up projects to support people. And that's a lot of the groups that we work with in our work. And the same thing happened in places like Bradford and Leeds and Sheffield. So there are community groups doing this sort of thing now. So on one hand, you've got the government saying this is a big problem. We mustn't have refugees coming here. On the other hand, you've got like, 
hundreds of thousands of people that are trying to do things to support people that are in Cali and in the Med that forced the government into this embarrassing U-turn recently where they said, we will not take any Syrian refugees whatsoever. And then, okay, we, nobody seems to agree with that. Uh, we'll, we'll allow a small number in over, um, over the next few years. Thank you very much. Um, and you did, actually, I was going to follow up with a question about, you know, well, what do you actually say then to somebody who, who feels they're at the blunt end when it comes to, um, you know, their local community and pressure on resources and so on? But I think you've already begun to kind of answer that in a way by giving these examples from Glasgow and uh, Leeds and Bradford and so on, where those kind of community organisations have grown up to tackle some of those kind of issues. Can we look at some more films? There's a lot of anger within British Muslims, right, okay. And this anger is the fact is that they are marginalised and silenced. And what and the, the everyday opinions of British Muslims is mar and the everyday contributions of British Muslims is marginalised and silenced. For me, being a Muslim is my faith, my beliefs, values, and for me being uh, British is not, uh, it's kind of not going, I mean, it's about uh, being involved in society, being part of the society, being the law of the society we live in. And I enjoy being British because I feel that it's diverse and we allow it different cultures and you learn from different cultures and different languages and different backgrounds. There's a wide range of faiths and even though I have my own faith. I can be open and learn from other people's faiths and be open to listen to what they have to say about their faiths. Okay, so um, we have some, uh, some points being made there about, about religion, a variety of different kinds of points. So I'm really interested by the last one, actually, which is uh, somebody reflecting that on their own background and having come to the UK from somewhere where they, where the expectation was that people would display their faith much more and everybody participated and they don't do that, young people don't do that so much anymore. So we have that being voiced, we have the idea about the difficulty of uh, being Muslim in Britain, expressing and, and, and enacting uh, uh, the Muslim faith, being Islamic in Britain. Um, and this young woman who talks about the fact that she's actually quite proud of being in a country with a diversity of faiths. Um, anybody want to pick up the issue about religion and faith? Do you, I yeah. Like. Okay. Well, speaking to somebody who doesn't subscribe, I think there's, there's two interesting points here. One is the, the idea that faith can build communities. And of course they do and they did. Communities have arisen around churches and mosques and synagogues. And that is one form of society and, and mostly a positive one. The negative one, as far as I can see, is this idea that there are moral values attached to having faith as opposed to not having faith, which is something that I would strongly dispute because given that I don't subscribe, I don't believe that my moral center is lacking just because I don't um, subscribe to a particular faith. And I think that, you know, sometimes we, we can have prejudices based on this that need to be addressed. The idea that I believe in a certain kind of religion, which makes me inherently a better person than you because you don't believe in it. I think this is a discussion that needs to be had and is, is actually had across the board of, of several religions and, and can sometimes cause real trouble. Thank you. Did you want to say something, Sam? You well, look like... I, I actually uh, I agree with what Joanne was saying because um, I think the problem is what we don't focus on is the fact that we do have a shared humanity which comes before any religion. And I find it quite funny. I mean, you see, and you see it with every religion. I go to church, so therefore I am better than you from that point of view. I see it in the Muslim community. I, I, I used to wear I, I walk hijab for a while. And, and you could walk into a room with a big polarisation of the ones who walk hijab or something. More slightly superior to also do that. So you do see that, and I think the thing is, in terms of building communities, if we actually focused on the things that actually bring us together rather than the differences, we would actually get a lot further. 
No, no, they're all they're shaking their heads. No, sorry, I've got... <laughs> No. Okay, so I was um, uh, yeah, no, thinking again about the kind of cultural side of this, and um, I'm, I'm not, I don't subscribe to any uh, religion either. Although I'm, I'm, I was brought up a Catholic, but in Wales rather than uh, Irish Catholic, and uh, um, highly marginal. Yeah, no, well, no, <laughs> uh, surprisingly not actually. But anyway, um, what was I thinking? That, that um, I was in India recently doing a, a project, a British Council project with Indian musicians and. Western musicians together in uh, in Mumbai, and one of the things we did while we were there, we were taken out to those of you who know Mumbai very well will know this. I can't remember the name of the mosque, but there's a mosque actually out in the bay, and you walk along this causeway to get to it when the tide's out, and it's absolutely beautiful. And we were taken out there to listen to devotional music being played after uh, after mosque, and um, it was just the most extraordinary thing. Um, and not so, you know, it was. Uh, yeah, it was incredibly moving, incredibly good music as well. And it was just done. It was done as part of a faith that that's what you do tonight. You come there and you, and you do this. And, and I thought that's, that's kind of lacking in my culture, that kind of spontaneous, devotional. And it wasn't, I mean, it was religious, obviously. It was at a, a mosque. But I thought that there is something I think about a lot, actually, is that, 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 that uh, there is perhaps in our culture here, the dominant culture here, there is a kind of spiritual gap, I think, and that kind of how we find the spiritual side to secular, to a largely secular society is really interesting, I think, and that is to do again with, with community and it's to do with culture. Um, so I was thinking about that. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just uh, see, just address you in the audience for a moment. Has anybody had a particular experience or a, a po very positive experience of the role religion plays in binding people together? Yeah, would you like to tell us about, a bit about it? No, I was raised in the most small village of the east, east side of the country. And it's awesome. and I went to a church through the school. My parents aren't particularly religious and I'm not even like, baptised. But I went to a church in the school and we were taught very simple tenets of faith, that is, unconditional love, love thy neighbour, do no harm, respect those around you. And I feel like that instilled a very singular moral code in me, even though I don't practice any particular faith, I don't, wouldn't call my comments anything. But it instilled a very particular thing in me of, let's say, love thy neighbour, you know, do it unto others as you would to, to yourself. And this might sound very flimsy, very weak and hollow, but that, in and of itself, like I say, growing up with that was, I feel it's positive because it, it instilled certain values in me. It instilled the concept of give to charities you know, because it's a good thing to do, help people in need because that's a good thing to do, not because of any kind of reward. Thank you very much for. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I want to give some positive examples. Okay, just one or two. Yeah. Three things I want to say. The first thing is the elite in Pakistan used to send their children to, to church schools because they were the best schools. Yeah, and colleges. They didn't come out as Christians. I can assure you. Second thing is example from the prophet's time. When people were being persecuted in Mecca, yeah, prophets sent them to Hajj, I think which is Ethiopia or Arabia. Because Christian king was there, he said to them, go there, you won't be harmed, you will get justice. Same as what Winston Churchill said when Germans were bombing London. He said, Is, are people getting justice? And the reply was yes. Third example, my friend Kote. I think you went to the mosque, yeah? Yeah, yeah. which had a tomb, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which had a Sufi stage right. tomb, yeah. mm -hmm. from where you got the music mm -hmm. and the songs. So I've given you three good examples. I declare my interest. I'm supposed to be founder member of Huddersfield Interfaith Council. 
Shape has become category of analysis now. Before it was social class, and obviously, when it suited the imperialists, then race was constructed, and, and they did, started taking people from Africa to America. Before they ignored them, when Vasco da Gama went around finding the way to India. Thank you. I, I rarely ha heard somebody speak. I managed to include Mohammed, Churchill, and Vasco da Gama in the same. <laughs> I, I, I admire that immensely. I, I would say the other thing that we, we mentioned earlier was the sanctuary movement, actually. You were talking about um, sanctuary theatre. And of course, the sanctuary movement uh, was intriguingly a, um, a partnership, really, between religious and non religious people working together around issues of. Um, uh, migration and welcoming the stranger and uh, I think that's a it's a it remains a very good example of how people can work across the board irrespective of their particular backgrounds um, where did we get up to we had faith did we have anything else in that bunch of films education, education? what we need is for the education system to come to us to ask us what would we like to see taught in schools and how should we teach it? They need to come to us. They don't. They exclude us. Why is it that young people are in little knowledge of the politics education? How would you go about getting young people informed and voting? Okay, so uh, the importance of political education uh, and this point made at the beginning about um, which really reflects the idea that maybe our curriculum uh, doesn't really serve the either the needs, interests or the histories perhaps of uh, everybody within, within the nation and maybe ought better to reflect by asking people uh, what they would like to have in the curriculum, better reflect uh, our the diverse nation that we are. Uh, so anybody got any idea? Anybody got any ideas about how to get people voting? Let's see if anybody uh, can, can go with that one. I can go, yeah, something. okay, good. Yeah, uh, get people voting, or rather would it not be more important to get people, uh, especially young people, involved in some sort of political process that, uh, involved in democracy? rather than just asking them to do something every four or five years to cast a vote for you know, A, B or C parties which uh, more or less stand for the same sort of politics of an ever so slightly different flavour. Um, if there was maybe more on offer for people to get involved in, they might feel that, uh, um, that they could get involved in these things and maybe get involved, say they did want to get involved in a political party, start their own like people are doing in Scotland at the moment. Uh, as a result of um, probably feeling that they've been abandoned by uh, political parties that were supposed to represent them for generations and haven't. I think it's not really so much that uh, there's a lack of education or there's apathy, it's more uh, that there is absolutely nothing on offer for young people that come from any of the mainstream political parties at the moment. Um, that's not to say that there is no avenue for people to get involved in what you might broad, more broadly call uh, democracy and uh, politics. We see it in, lots of different countries at the moment um, across like South America and across um, Southern Europe where young people are getting very much engaged and not just young people, people who have not been engaged in any politics at all are rejecting the political parties from representing them and thinking well if there's things that need doing in our neighbourhoods, in our workplaces, in our communities we can get involved and start doing that just now and then that from the grassroots up the politicians have to come down and meet them at that level and I think I'd see some of that where, where I live in London, that people are getting more involved. They're not going to the councillors or their MPs to say you have to do something about the, the situation in our housing estates, which are being sold off and the gentrification that's happening. They're starting to do things themselves. There are groups that are getting set up and saying, OK, we're going to remain in our council homes. You're not going to kick us out knock half of them down and build uh, yuppie flats for people to move into. We're going to take control of these flats and actually forcing the politicians to come to them and, uh, and uh, meet them halfway and say, look, you know, we will start doing things ourselves here. So I think there are ways that, that people can get involved in these things that 
doesn't need to be taught to them, that it doesn't need to be taught in school, that they can learn in their communities, and it possibly could be more important than just asking them to go out every five years and cast uh, a single vote. Thank you very much. Did, did, uh, go, go ahead, John. I, I, I used to be a teacher. I taught in, a, in schools for 15 years. And one of the things that struck me, which is fundamentally different about the school system in England to the one in France, is that in England there is a very targeted form of teaching which tells the kids there is an answer which if you are very good I am going to impart to you and which you will then repeat for the rest of your school career and this will give you pieces of paper which will hopefully allow you to get a job. That doesn't quite happen in France. In France there is a great deal more involvement with the student and their own opinions and trying to inform their opinions. And it, it seems to me that perhaps we should be looking at something like this. In France there are citizenship classes from quite an early age which explain the voting options and how the voting system works and why you are involved in it and why it's important to be involved in it. It's not telling people how to vote, it's telling them that there are these options available and that they're important. Um, it's also a secular system. Now some of you will know that I am very pro-secular education. I think it's important for us not to limit our young people to knowledge of just one belief. It's quite important to have religious education which allows young people to understand what other people believe without telling them what to believe or without focusing on one particular belief. It's about expanding their choices because obviously religious education is available if, if, if what you want is religious instruction. It's available in places of worship. But religious broadening of the mind and this ability to form connections with people of different faiths, sometimes that school is the only place that young people can get it. Um, and it seems to me that these things are all going to contribute, perhaps, to, to young people's sense of their own agency and their own self-worth and their own ability to contribute something to this society that they're going to be poured into. Because one of the reasons that young people don't always vote is that they don't think it will make a difference. They don't think that they will make a difference. They don't feel that they're a part of this society and they don't understand how it works. And I think we should be trying to educate them about this from the very earliest age, showing them that they are a part of something which is extremely diverse and that they need to understand and actively be, be shown as opposed to having aspects of it closed off and hidden away. I, I agree completely with, with all of that. I, I think um, I, I, there's no coincidence that the uh, decline in younger people engaging with politics is also connected with the decline in uh, creative arts education in schools. I think I think that that uh, site, to use that word again, that site for questioning, interrogation of yourself and your identity and your relationship with the people around you is being completely eroded in, in state education for, for sure. And actually the, the religious education in my kids' state school, um, which is a non-religious school, um, is one of the places where they actually do get to ask questions and, and develop a sense of curiosity. And I think if there's one big thing that I think is... is um, uh, stopping young people from engaging with politics I, is I think that the the culture of curiosity is being is being driven out of people the being interested and curious about how other people live thank you very much so um, I mean we, we get a strong sense there of the importance of um, curiosity but also critical thinking um, exposure to diversity which um, may come through in the, co in the context of that very broad-based religious education that you're mentioning. Could I just ask, Simon, whether um, in the uh, Bradford Literature Festival, you know, is there much involvement of young people? Do you see young people particularly um, becoming agents in that kind of cultural process in Bradford? Is there space for them to do it? Do they have an interest in doing it? Um, it's absolutely um, a big... Part of the festival, uh, one of the big aims is actually to involve young people. It's about raising aspirations, raising literacy levels, all of that. So, um, for us, actually, um, involving young people, both by uh, what we do is um, we have a schools program, but it's not just um, 
what we try to do is sort of, some of the themes that we are actually discussing with the adult strands, a lot of the political things that we discuss, uh, a lot of the issues that we've been talking about previously that are the, the, the more difficult issues uh, to discuss at times, but we feel it's actually really important for young people to discuss these. We take those into schools. And we've had, we've had really positive feedback from that, so we've had a lot of young people who've come forward who want to volunteer. Um, We've been sort of holding feedback sessions to try to actually uh, gauge what they want to hear about. So it's actually for us that whole thing of creating um, change through culture. It has to go. It has to sort of come from bottom up, not just in terms of community, but actually in terms of young people as well. Lovely. Right. Quick audience vote then on uh, who, how many of you think the um, the voting age should be reduced in throughout. Uh, the UK to 16, from 18 to 16. How many of you would bring down the voting age? Lots of you. So uh, you've got confidence in young people, and maybe for some of the reasons that have been expressed here. Um, do we want to show more video? What does the Queen actually do? Because as far as I'm concerned, she's just a tourist attraction. OK. So, uh, um, uh, you know, we are rethinking the nation. So it, it, it's, it's important that we have a question about the Queen, or more particularly about the monarchy, and about what... Uh, maybe I won't ask the panel to reflect on what the Queen actually does, but if I could ask you to think about whether uh, you, you think there is a role for the monarchy in a modern, future-looking Britain, um, and we'll see what the panel says, and then uh, we'll see whether there's any, there's any other contesting views in the audience. Who would like to uh, start us off on that? Can I pass it to you, Michael? Oh, go on, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I guess that the monarchy could have a role in the future nation of Britain, maybe as um, occasional contestants on Strictly or something. <laughs> um, uh, well, yeah, I mean, they, they possibly could function as a tourist attraction, but just maybe uh, a little bit more efficiently and, and more cost effective than what they do now. I wouldn't, you know, put them completely out of house and home, but, you know, the, some of their homes could be used to a better purpose, perhaps. I better not say any more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's give it to I think, actually, um, in terms of what we've been talking about, I think the monarchy is tied up in that whole thing I don't think we can actually get away from that. I think, although um, you know, there's all this thing about they are just purely tourist attractions, I think there is more to it. Um, I think there are sort of there are sort of a bit more deep rooted in the national psyche. Um, I think there is more of them to play. I don't, I don't know how expensive it is. Maybe it could be a bit more streamlined. I certainly do think that you put all these papers out of business if you take them on key. <laughs> Okay, let's see what colleagues at this end say. No, I don't really. Um, I, I have to say that my, my French side finds the idea of a, a hereditary <laughs> monarchy completely absurd and outdated. My English side is quite fond of at least the Queen. It is a very large family. Much of it doesn't seem to do very much except misbehave, spend money and get in the papers. There is a core center of it that I think has a value, I think, uh, in ambassadorial terms, in, in terms of saying things in a way that nobody else is able to say. Um, I, I do kind of, the, the little kind of revolutionary part of me does kind of wish that the Queen would have a bus pass and, and, um, and a pension and, and would be allowed to retire gracefully and happily. Um, she might be happier. Um, other people would probably be happier too. Um, I, think that, I think you're right, they, they do have a role and whatever it is that they do, some of them do an awful lot of it. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, the, I don't think the Queen has had an hour's uh, no. time to herself for about 90 years no. now, which is, you know, yeah. it is fair enough. I think, you know, that's... My, my great problem is the idea that this hereditary family of overlords was somehow appointed by God mm. and that we should be grateful. Mm. I think perhaps that dynamic now needs to, needs to die. Even if we don't actually have to guillotine our royal family, perhaps we could just <laughs> normalize them just a little and bring them into the fold and accept the role that they do um, without having to glorify them quite as much mm. as, as has been done in past centuries.
that's as revolutionary as I'm going to get. <laughs> I, think, I think they absolutely have no role at all um, to play in, in the future. But, uh, I mean, as, as a kind of, if you unpick it, if, we, if the historians unpick them as examples of assimilated migrancy, then that's quite interesting. We could do that. And, um, in fact, I had a quote from... Um, Daniel Defoe in 1700, defending William of Orange, taking the throne. I'll see if I can find it, because it's quite good, actually. He's done his homework. I did do a bit of homework on that, because I thought it was a very interesting quotation. I hope I can find it. He said, Daniel Defoe, 1700, defined the true-born Englishman. And he said, fate jumbled them together, God knows how. Whatever they were, they're true-born English now. And that was defending the fact that we had a Dutch king on the throne. Um, uh, I think history is really interesting in this, in this sense. I think, um, coming back to the question about education and curiosity, I think there's so much receivedness in the British national culture and so little curiosity in how those things came to be there and what things you might need to do in order to take them away from being there or to challenge them. And I think that that, again, I think, it's, I think the continued existence of our monarchy goes hand in hand with... Um, goes hand in hand with the way that we educate our children. It, it seems to be completely implausible that we still have a monarch, uh, but there they are. And it's got to be something to do with how, how our younger generations are educated, because they shouldn't, they shouldn't tolerate it, you lot at the back. <laughs> OK, actually, a wider range of views in some ways than I thought. Now, I am going to ask a question, a kind of last question. And I'm going to tell you what it is now, and then I'm going to go back to the audience for the monarchy. Uh, but I'm just going to put it to you now so that you can be thinking about it. Um, so uh, uh, the, in the ex current extremism strategy that the government has, of course, uh, they're, part of the way they're thinking about is ex extremism is through the focus on British values. And British values, some of those British values, of course, are democracy and the rule of law and so on. But what I want to ask you to think about is, what do you think? So scrapping, you know, what's on the government's list of British values for the moment, what would you put, and it might be one of those, what would you put top of your list of British values? Okay, and you can choose, th so think about it, what, what do you think is a key value for if we're thinking about uh, if we're rethinking the nation, what would be top of your list of values? So be thinking about that. Uh, I'm coming back to the audience now to, uh, I'm going to ask you, so how many Republicans do we have in the audience? How many Republicans do we have in the audience? We do have a few Republicans. So scattered about the place. And how many, uh, so does that mean the rest of you are pro-monarchy? So if I say how many people are pro uh, the British monarchy. Can I have a show of hands for that? Pro-British monarchy. So actually, I think the Republicans have it. Are there, are there people who are sitting on the fence on this one? You didn't know what you meant. <laughs> you didn't know what I meant when I said... Republican men. Oh, Republicans. So how many people are against having uh, the monarchy? Hands up. So let's take that again. Yeah, that looks like that's going to win. So <laughs> the, the, there are more Republicans than there are pro monarchy pro pro the queen um, in terms of in terms of those of you who do feel uh, it's important to have a monarch or that there's some value in it uh, shout out why you think it's a good idea to have a monarch what's good about the queen she's head of commonwealth she's head of the commonwealth any head of commonwealth yeah any interfere in politics either all right well okay that's good that's what what Blair. I've got one for you. yeah go on it prevents <laughs> okay, that's great. So, yes, there's, it, it's, it kind of helps with the balance of power in, in, in that respect. Any other reason, any reasons over here why you think it's good to have a monarch? If it's not broken, don't fix it. Yeah. If it's not broken, don't fix it. So it's a little bit of a discussion. If you had any views, well, sorry, they're, they're, they're busy having a little discussion over here. So uh, if, it, if it works, don't fix it. But you're saying, does it work? Yeah, it's, it's the tip of a big iceberg. And frankly, it's a distraction to get to start talk about the monarchy. The, the fact I'm a, you can categorise me as a white middle-class male, 
And I don't have uh, any sense of identification with the democratic system that this country has. So why should somebody who's you know, younger, doesn't fit in the quote unquote mainstream, whatever that is, have any space or, or identification with that? I mean, how can I, you know, how, I mean, it, it's bust, frankly. And, and the monarchy is just the easy target. Okay. Um, is it a gender thing? Do, so, uh, so I haven't heard, we've heard some male voices, mostly against it, apart from the one, well, it, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, do you think um, that uh, women are more in favour of the monarchy than men? Any views? No, you don't think so? <laughs> Uh, what would happen, so we had the view over here that, uh, well, what would the papers do if uh, we didn't have, the monarch, uh, didn't have the monarchy? How important is the monarchy for popular culture? How important are the papers? Yeah. Okay, so part, they're part of celebrity culture. We've got a hand up over there. Yes, I think I think the view was expressed in the last of the electoral elite and how we've been involved with lots of royal visits. From the basic point of view, um, having uh, spoken and been involved with the general public who gather, the enthusiasm mm. of the Queen is often overwhelming. Um, yeah, as you see on television, the room just to get a glimpse of the Queen or whoever the other royal person is being. Uh, so whilst among a group like this the royal family may not be very popular, there are a huge number of people around there with whom they are and who do see them as performing a valuable Thank you very much for voicing that. I think well, they can pay for them, make yeah. perhaps a pay per Oh yeah, right. We're gonna I'm gonna have to go back to my question on British values now because I'm getting the Oh, she's saying, that's it? Well, if we, if we just have our last point for the British values. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So uh, this is our lot. We've, we've already been, you know, I'm getting all those, those signs and symbols saying stop. Not about the Queen. Not about the Queen, no, about you lot. It's entirely we'll about the panel. The French. <laughs> it's entirely the panel who will be beheaded if we go over. So, uh, so I'm just going to go round the panel now and ask for your British value of choice. I don't believe there are British values. I believe there are human values that we all understand and should embrace. Even democracy is a Greek value, as you all know, because they're the ones who supposedly invented it. But I think we all understand decency and tolerance, apart from the things which are intolerable, of course, and loving thy neighbour, regardless of which holy book tells us to do it, because actually we all know that this is the right thing to do, and having a proper integrated society where people understand each other, learn from each other, welcome each other, and don't feel so insecure that they have to push everybody away who isn't absolutely identical to them. This is a human value, and I think that Britons have it in spades, and they should jolly well hang on to them. Thank you. Um. I think the British have a great, I think British do have a great sense of satire and that's a value that I think we should hold on to. Thank you. Yeah, British values, it depends on who you ask. I mean, we're sitting in the Imperial War Museum. You could say that some people would say the British values are empire and war that we've been very popular and very, very, um, uh, very good at doing over the, the centuries. But yeah, it just depends on who you ask. And I, I would say like, when, when growing up in Glasgow, I didn't have any sort of idea of British values. The community I grew up in was an internationalist community, and whether it was because uh, of my uh, grandparents' Catholic background and their use of the word solidarity, or whether it was my parents' uh, Marxist background of their growing up and their use of the word solidarity, that came from completely different ways, but it was all about yeah, being in togetherness and things. So, yeah, I mean, I would say that, yeah, solidarity would be something that I would hope uh, is something that binds us together. Um, I think I, I agree with, the, uh, with Joanne in the sense of that it's actually about human values. And I think actually if we look at historically the values that are being perceived to be British values 
are actually values that everybody has shared. I think the, the current debate about British values is actually one way of um, trying to point to groups that we are trying to say don't have these mm. values and therefore they are different to us and therefore they are not actually truly British. So it's actually being used as a bit of a means of um, dividing all of us, um, it's another form of that. So I think it's, it's common human values and everybody has those. Thank you very much and I, I think it's, uh, it's good to end on the idea that, that as members of the nation we too can have a say about what's important and I think that's what this debate's really been all about and I would just like to very much thank uh, my colleagues on the panel for their answers and for their, you know, their deliberation on these difficult issues and very much also thank those of you in the audience for chiming up when, when we needed some, uh, some interventions. Uh, as well as uh, all the folks who've really done their very, very best to get the tech working for us, and we really appreciate that. Is there anything that you'd... Oh, I'm passing over to Paul, I think. Uh, but I'd just like to thank... Uh, thank Jodie and Paul for all the hard work that they've done. They've been critical. <laughs>